All right, well, welcome everyone uh, to our executive leadership webinar. Uh, it's called See You at the Top, Plotting Your Path to Executive Leadership. Our presenters today are Pam and Ken Jodok. Uh, they have held a variety of executive leadership positions throughout their career, and they're gonna talk to us about their journey and how they got there. Uh, so thank you for joining us. If you have any technical difficulties, please uh, feel free to type it in the chat and I'll help you out with that. We will have a Q&A at the end, so if you have any questions, you can type those out as well. And I will be keeping track of those and we can ask them at the end. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to pass it over to our presenters. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Andrea. Welcome, everyone. We hope you're all having a great day. I appreciate you taking time from your very busy, I'm sure, coronavirus schedules to join us for this presentation today. Uh, Andrea, and we, speaking of technical difficulties, we have had a couple already, so Andrea's going to control the slides for us. So, Andrea, if you want to move to the next slide. Before we dig into the presentation, we want to let you know that you're not going to see a lot of um, charts and, and um, statistics in tonight's presentation. We were asked, as Andrea mentioned, to speak specifically to our own experience in moving into executive leadership roles, some of the challenges that we faced along the way and um, the duties that we were expected to execute in some of those roles, and also to offer any suggestions we might have about things that you can be doing now to plot your own path to executive leadership. Thanks. Thank you. But before we dip in, dive in, we'd like to uh, give you a chance to get to know us a little bit better. So Ken, why don't you go first? Hello, I'm Ken Jodak, and uh, prior to retirement, I was the Zone Sales Director for Frito-Lay. Uh, I did part of that in the Midwest, covering four states, and then finished my career in Western Washington. That job pertains to running a district and re for all sales and distribution of Frito-Lay products. So I had several warehouses, several district offices, uh, 14 managers, hundreds of employees, and thousands of customers, probably about 35,000 customers, or 3,500 customers. Uh, so I began my career on the front line, although I attended uh, community college and I attended the University of Southern California, I did not get my degree. Uh, and I would not recommend this because a degree absolutely opens up doors for you. Uh, and as a result, I spent much, much of my time coming through different stops and lateral positions before I achieved some of the roles that I did uh, moving forward in my career. And we'll cover through some of those uh, opportunities and challenges as we move through our presentation today. So I'm going to take it over to Pam at this point to introduce herself. Thank you, Dave. So I am a former Assistant Vice President of Legislative Affairs for one of the nation's largest commercial health insurance companies and a retired Senior Director for a global healthcare association. Uh, I'm also a high school dropout who didn't get her four-year degree until I was in my mid-40s. The first 20 years of my career were spent as a military spouse, which meant that I was moving every three years and starting with an, over with a new employer, usually in an administrative role. But what I tried to do during that period of my life was each time we moved, I looked for a position that was slightly, had slightly more responsibility than the job that I'd been leaving. And through that process over time, I was able to create a strong enough resume that I eventually became eligible for management. And when I was able to stay in one place for longer than three years, I had a strong enough foundation of skills that I was able to move from an administrative assistant role into an assistant vice president role in just five years. And once I reached that level, my resume and the relationships I built through networking opened doors for me that allowed me to continue moving up the executive ladder. Next slide, please, Andrea. And so we thought it might be helpful as we start our presentation to have a shared understanding of what it is we mean by executive leadership. Webster provides a pretty clear explanation of what it means to be an executive, but as we looked for a definition of leadership, we found that it's a much squishier term. In fact, the uh, definition that we've chosen to use for the presentation comes from small business and then it refers to it as an art. And so what's important to note is that leadership is not about having a position of authority over others. It's about the ability to apply a combination of personality and relationship skills in such a way that you're able to engage others in a way that makes them want to follow you 
not because they have to, but because they respect you and admire you and they want to follow your lead. Next slide. So the promotional materials for this uh, webinar referenced uh, an article from the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics that said that over the next 10 years, U.S. businesses are expected to fill approximately 150,000 executive level positions. So we thought it would be really helpful if we could give you a short list of skills that you need to master over the next few years in order to be eligible for one of those positions. But guess what? There is no short list. The truth is that executive leadership requires a myriad of overlapping skill sets. You need to not only have a strong business specific knowledge, but also understand how the various departments and divisions within your organization work together to achieve overarching goals. Understand how what happens in the industry affects your individual business and how your individual business affects the industry as a whole. You should not only be able to give clear direction and speak intelligently about goals and objectives, but you're expected to be able to negotiate outcomes and to possibly mediate differences, not only between those who report to you, but between you and your peers, or possibly even to those above you. So if you wait until you become an executive to master these skills, you will not become an executive. First, you become a leader, and then you become an executive leader. And you get plenty of opportunity to learn these skills along the way. Yes. So let's take a look at how Ken and I approached our path to executive leadership. So besides having a degree, which helps open doors, not only when you first enter an organization, but it continues as you go through an organization. But the second most important thing is the value of networking. Once you get into an organization, you figure out, well, where do, what level position do I want? And if you want to be a, whether it's a vice president or a director, uh, look at the career paths. Talk to some of these people when you can. What are the career paths that got them there? And then find out who are in those positions today and then get to know them. And when I say get to know them, don't just get to know who they are as far as their names so far. Really get to know who they are and try and use them as mentors and ways to, to help bridge where you go. Uh, and I will tell you also, networking, you, as we move to the next one, be careful of bridges you burn. I have had the opportunity to work for uh, people who worked for me at times and who went and promoted through their system. And before you know it, I run into them and uh, they're my next boss. And so you have to be careful about any bridges you burn because you never know where someone else may be uh, five, 10 years down your road in your career. I remember, you know, Ken. There was an opportunity when uh, we were working in Missouri and then Ken had an opportunity to come back to the Pacific Northwest. And it was really fun for me uh, because I had not known Ken when he started his career in the, in the PAC Northwest, but he actually came back as, um, as his own sales leader to the same area where he had started as a route salesperson. And his sales team was having a difficult time getting sales. And Ken would say, well, have you talked to the, the store director? He's, he's a store director. And, and they'd give him a name. And he'd go, oh, I know him. We used to bag groceries together. I know him. We used to work in the grocery store business together. I would work with him when I was at Fred Meyer. And it was, it was great how Ken was able to leverage those relationships to help his employees make a sale. And if he had burned any of those bridges along the way, it might have been a very different story. Oops, solid networks really helped out. The power of sharing, I would tell you to be... He, on this particular one, a couple of points I want to make. Number one is just because you're doing a great job and you're getting great results doesn't mean that someone's recognizing it. So make sure that you share your uh, successes with your boss and do that. Usually I'll tell you to do that one on one. And then when your team has successes, make sure you share those successes of your team and give credit where credit is due. Don't try and take all the credit yourself always hand it to your team, always do it in public when you can. And sharing also goes with the fact that you need to use your knowledge and expertise to, to share with others, to bring them up through the organization themselves. Because you'll have a, a difficult time moving on to your next level, as I found, if you don't train someone to take your place when, you're, when you leave. Uh, and then next, sharpen the saw. This is from uh, Franklin Covey, and there's a lot of ways to go about this, but number one, 
just when you leave school, your knowledge and learning never stops. You should make sure that you stay on top of current statistics and periodicals that have to do with your business. You should stay on top of different leadership books and team building books so you continue to find out the latest ways to not only build your own skills and leadership, but to also build the skills of your team and so forth. And also a sharp result is work-life balance. If you don't go out and spend some time to take care of yourself and do things you love, you're gonna get dull and you'll burn out. So really making sure that you schedule time in your calendar to take care of those personal relationships and yourself to make sure that you stay sharp all the time. So I'm gonna talk, hand it over to Pam on uh, Make Every Job Count. Great, thank you, babe. You know, one of the things Ken and I have observed in our own career is that sometimes we come across people who are so focused on getting to the top of their career ladder that they fail to have a pr appropriate value. They undervalue the positions that they hold along the way. So whether you're at the bottom of a very long ladder or if you're in the middle of a fast track program, I would encourage you to take the time to appreciate every single job that you hold along the way. Take the time to master the skills that are required for that job and understand how that job contributes to the overall success of the business. Because no matter how small the job it is, trust me, there's a reason that you're there and it does add value to the company. Understand that value. This understanding will not only strengthen your relationship with others as you move through the organization, it will help you when you get to your executive leadership roles to understand the downstream impact of the decisions that you make. And trust me, as an executive leader, every decision that you make has a downstream impact. And the better that you're able to understand what that impact could be, to forecast that impact, to help mitigate whatever negative impact that may be, the more successful you will be as a leader. So make sure that you value the jobs that you have. And while you're in those jobs, don't let your title define your contribution. I remember as an administrative assistant, I was tasked with just providing administrative support to a group of executives who were responsible for developing a five-year plan for the company. This company had been in business for over 60 years, but they'd never had a five-year plan. And I really assumed that these you know, big, smart executives who clearly had to be 10 times smarter than I was because they were making 10 times more money than I was, right? Um, would know exactly what to do. And I was just gonna be typing out notes and organizing the information for them. But as it turned out, none of them had a clue where to begin. And I had some ideas on that. And so at, at one point after watching them struggle, I went to my boss and I shared my ideas and my approach to that five-year plan helped them. It provided structure for them to get the job done. So there's never a position that's too small to have a good idea. So make sure that, that you don't just let your title define your contribution. And also um, along those lines, when you see something that needs that could be improved in your organization, something could, that could be done differently, or you're experiencing a challenge and you want to talk to your boss about it, my suggestion would be that anytime you bring a problem to the table, make sure that you have at least one or two ideas of how you might solve that problem. I want to tell you, if you have a, if you're going to share a problem, always bring the solution yeah. and and you will be looked upon much more positively from everyone involved absolutely so anybody can tell you i always used to tell people i anybody can tell me i got a flat tire when i'm sitting on the side of the road but unless you're bringing a jack and i know how to do it i really don't need to know that i got a flat tire don't need any reinforcements for that so and also while you're in your current role look for opportunities to to contribute beyond that. Um, there are a lot of organizations, for example, that do um, employee morale boosters. And sometimes they'll do an employee satisfaction survey and they'll identify things that they want to work on as an organization. And they'll ask for volunteers to participate in a committee to help them with that. Be one of those volunteers. If your company is, uh, is supportive of community activism and you have an opportunity to do a day of volunteering, Organize a group of people to go participate in Habitat for Humanity or, or Humanity or do a food drive or anything along those lines. When you do those kinds of activities, you gain exposure to other people in the organization and uh, at all different levels. People who might never know your name, might never know your face, suddenly they not only know who you are, but they know your kids' names, they know what your goals and objectives are, they know that 
you want to be more than, than what you are in your current role. And they may become aware of positions that come open in the company and they can say to the hiring manager or they can say to you, you know, did you ever think about this person? Or, you know, you might want to talk to so-and-so about this job they have coming available. It's that little exposure can go a long way in opening doors for you in your organization or outside your organization in the community. Ken talked a little bit about networking earlier. I would say to you, you should have a good five minute elevator speech because you never know when you're gonna run into the president of the company riding up to the elevator to the next floor or going to the bathroom. So you gotta be ready to take advantage of those opportunities for networking whenever they come along. Calculated risk is a really big deal. And you would be, um, you might be surprised at how risk averse people can be, especially when it comes to their career. But I would say that from my perspective, it is the number of risks that you take, calculated again, not reckless, but oftentimes determine how far and how fast you can go in your career. And one of my favorite examples of this is that shortly after Ken and I were married, he had an opportunity to step into what he considered his dream role at Rita Lay. The challenge was he had his choice of one of three geographic locations. However, my company didn't do business in any of those three locations. So for Ken to accept his promotion would mean that our family was going to lose 50%, literally 50% of its income. So after a lot of discussion of pros and cons, we made the decision for Ken to accept that position. We moved to a new, another state. I gave up my employment for a period of time and Ken encouraged me to take another risk when we made this move. At the time, I was working full time and going to school full time. And I knew that I was working above my degree level and that I would have a difficult time competing for a position at the same level as the one that I was leaving without my four-year degree. So Ken encouraged me to take a year off from my employment, complete my degree, and then re-enter the workforce. We anticipated that when I did that, I would still have a 30% cut in pay just because of the cost of living and the job market where we had moved to. But the risk paid off because I was actually able to find a remote position that gave me a 20% increase in pay over what we had been making in Portland in a market where the cost of living was substantially lower. So it worked out great. And for Ken, the risk that he took in, in moving to a, a state where he knew no, no one um, continued to open doors for him for Frito that allowed him to achieve much greater career success than if he had said thank you, but no thank you and stayed where he was comfortable and knew what he was doing. This last one, Ken is a master at, so I'm gonna pass it off to Ken. I want to say attitude is everything. Positive attitude is everything. Being able to walk in with a can-do attitude when people throw uh, challenges your way instead of saying, oh, that, that'll never work or that, you know, it, that's, that goal's too high. Going with that at too low. What if it can? If it could, how would we do it? And, and if you always come in with a positive attitude, people are always going to gravitate towards you. And I'll tell you, as a, the shadow of the leader was very evident, if I ever came to work in a, in a, in a poor mood, which was pretty rare, uh, people noticed right away. And sometimes they would not want to get too close. So I made sure that uh, I was always in a good mood. And even if I wasn't, I wasn't going to let anybody know. I was going to have a great time. And I was going to make sure that they had a great time. But positive attitude is, is everything. It can happen and it can work. So Ken, how you doing? I'm having so much fun, I can't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a standard answer. Next slide, please. So uh, the next one is, it can be a rough and rocky road. Others don't see me as someone who can succeed in the position. This is probably the first thing. Well, let's just let them know. What we're talking about in this slide is uh, um, the challenges that we faced, right? So yeah. even if you do all of the things on the previous slide just perfectly, you're still gonna have challenges along the way. And some of you may be going through one of those challenges even as we speak. And so this is just a short example of some of the things Ken and I have experienced in our careers. Sure. At one point, I was, so others don't see me as someone to be promoted. And when I was a young man and uh, I wanted to be a store director and I was in retail. And uh, finally the vice president happened to be in one day and, and I was wondering when I was not getting promoted. I was always had, had an excellent work ethic my performance was good, my team's performance was good, but I was not getting promoted. And uh, fortunately, this was a bold man who was willing to be honest with me. And at the time, I was so busy working that uh, I didn't comb my hair all the time. 
I, I, I let it grow too long. I never took time to go out and get a haircut. My clothes really didn't fit me that well. And he was very honest and blunt with me and says, you know, Ken, you need to get regular haircuts. You need to stay groomed and dress for the job you want, not for the job you have. So I, uh, I, I did that. And in short order, I was soon promoted because A, I made the change. I took the criticism as constructive criticism and I did the things that I needed to do. The next one was my boss says I'm too valuable in my current role. Uh, that happened to me when I was offered a job in Hawaii and I was offered my own island. I could go over there and have my own island, but unfortunately uh, the vice president, everyone approved uh, that I could go, but no one told my boss. And my boss says, Ken, we don't have anybody to take your place. You're not going to Hawaii. So consequently, I didn't get my own island, and I learned one thing there. I need to make sure I prepare people to take my role when I leave. And then the other job was located in another city or state. Pam covered that a little bit uh, when we went to Missouri. It also happened when I went to uh, Portland. Uh, there, a new job came open in Portland, and uh, I volunteered. And says I told my bosses, I met this wonderful lady. And I need to I need to move to Portland. And I uh, says, well, I'll see what I can do. And that's when they realized that they were creating a new position that was right down my alley in finance at the time. And uh, once they found out that uh, I was interested, I became I got to interviews and within three months I had the job. So make sure people understand that you're able to relocate and you're willing to go. And what's important about that particular story is that they already had another candidate selected for that job, to be honest. They didn't know that Ken was willing to move. They assumed that he didn't want to move because he had purposely come back to um, the PAC Northwest some years before in his career. Um, so the, that's why it's important for, for you to make sure that people know you're willing to move because they might make the assumption that you won't move. The other thing I would say about this is sometimes people use this as, as their own barrier is that the jobs in another city or state, and they just make an assumption that they can't make that move. They think I, I can't afford to move, or I can't ask my family to move, I can't ask my kids to change schools. And I would just encourage you to talk with your family and, and talk with your, if, if there are other people who will be impacted by your decision, talk to them about whether or not they really would be willing to move. Because if this is a risk, as we talked about earlier, that would be beneficial to you, then it's probably gonna be beneficial to your family in the long run. And you might be surprised at the support you get in taking that risk. And I would encourage you to seriously consider this risk. It's okay to get outside your comfort zone. When you do something that's just a little bit uncomfortable for you, what you find is that you really grow as a person. And, and the more things you do that are, are uncomfortable for you, the bigger your world becomes, the fewer things become barriers and stand in your way. Then I also wanted to go back to your thing about others don't see me as someone who can see this position. Can, can you say something about um, if, if you apply for a role and someone just, they don't think you have the skills. You think you're the perfect person for this job, but they see you as that administrative assistant or that route salesperson, and they don't see you as the manager that you see yourself as. Do you have thoughts about what people can do in that situation? Well, A, I will tell you, it's, it really comes, I go back to positive attitude starts with that, but you have to be inquisitive about what does it take to get in that role. Start asking questions and show that you're interested in the role. And then once someone has told you what, what's necessary, take the time to go out and learn those things and make sure the decision makers know that you're going to get the extra education or skills necessary to move into that next level. I have seen an, uh, an admin that I've had promoted into the district level and done, has done a great job. I've tried to move some of them into HR roles and uh, they've done great jobs. But you know, people that came before me did not see that in them and you really just get to sometimes pull it out of them. And people, I think most people want to grow. I've always said no one comes to work and says, today I'm going to do a horrible job. <laughs> They all, all want to do a better job and they want more. So um, this job requires a degree that I don't have. This happened for me um, in my, when I was a manager in a role. And at that time I had my two year degree. I had not yet earned my four year degree. And uh, 
I was looking for personal reasons to move from Portland, Oregon to Seattle. And a job was posted, but it was posted at an AVP level. But as I read through the job description, it was very similar to the job I was currently doing. And I had actually created this role for that was now becoming uh, a position in all four of our geographic location, locations. And so I knew I could do this job. I believed I was the best candidate for the job. But when I read the requirements, it listed that you not only had to have a degree, you had to have a law degree. I was far from a law degree with my associates. So I found out who the hiring manager was. It was not someone I knew. And I went on the employee website and I found her extension and I called her. And, I, and my intent was to ask if we could arrange you know, for a half hour at some point where I could talk to her about the job. And she said, well, let's just talk now. So I had to do some quick thinking. And I just started asking, I said, you know, I'm interested in applying for the position, but I don't want to waste my time in applying or your time in interviewing me if I'm not the right candidate. So I just wanted to get a clear understanding of what you're looking for. What are the skill sets that are most important to you, the attributes you'd like this person to have? So we talked for about a half an hour and then towards the end of the conversation and during that time, as she was saying what she was looking for, I was able to share information about my skills and what I would be bringing to the table in this role. And so she was getting interested. And towards the end of the conversation, I said, I said, so how important is the law degree to you? And, and she said, I don't know, I haven't really thought about it. She said, does it, is, is it, does it matter? And she said, is, is there a reason you asked? And I said, yeah, I said, I would love to apply, but currently, as it's written, the job description says that it requires a law degree. So I don't have one and I wouldn't make it past the application process. And she said, oh, that's no problem. She said, I'll just change required to preferred and to give me 48 hours, we'll change the listing and you can apply for the job. So we did, I applied and I got the job. And that was my AVP role that I stepped into where I oversaw and had lawyers reporting to me and I didn't have a law degree. They didn't know that, they didn't need to know that. My boss and I knew. Um, I don't have the, ex the specific experience outlined in the job requirement. This is something that's really common for those of you who are new college grads or, or about to be college grads. You've, you've spent the time getting the degree in the field that you want to go into, but you haven't had an opportunity to work in that field yet. And yet every position you apply for, even entry level, wants two or three years worth of experience. And you're thinking, how am I supposed to get the experience if you won't hire me? So my approach for this was that it, appeared, it occurred to me that they weren't necessarily looking for the job specific skills, they were looking for um, the, the skills themselves rather than the direct job experience, I should say. So I would encourage you as you're building your resume to apply in a new industry is to think about how you can incorporate some of those words that we referenced on the fifth slide of this presentation, using words things like developed or um, analyzed or coordinated or created or negotiated or achieved or streamlined. Take, take action, active words like that that demonstrate what your skills are, what your abilities are. How you apply those abilities is less important than the fact that you have those abilities. And then when you approach your resume, I would say organize your information in what is referred to as a SAR, which is you list the situation the action that you took to address that situation and the results that you got as um, because of the action that you took. And if you lay out your resume in that way, you can talk more about your specific job skills themselves when you get into the interview, but it gives those who are um, evaluating your resume a much better picture of who you are and what your capabilities are. It also helps you for those positions where they're doing word search and they're just, you're getting a thousand applications for one role. And if the, Resume doesn't have specific words in it. You don't even get past the front door. So um, take the time to understand what words they're looking for and incorporate those into your resume. And finally, this is a new position and there's no blueprint for what's expected. So that might be scary to you. You think, how am I supposed to know what success looks like in this role? These for me are my very favorite positions because the sky is the limit and you can make it anything you want it to be. So when you have an opportunity to apply for a position that's brand new that nobody's ever been in before, I would say think about, in your mind, what would you do with that position? Make some time to talk with the hiring manager. Ask them what they're looking for. When you, if you get a chance to go in for the interview, be sure that you have some good questions prepared to ask them specifically, how do you see this role contributing to the organization? How are you going to measure success in this role? and be prepared with your own set of answers for that and say, 
when they give you your answer, then you can say, well, have you thought about, or I wonder if, or if I were in this role, it would be important to me too. Hopefully some of these um, sound familiar to you maybe, and we've given you some helpful hints on how you might be able to get past them as well. And on the next slides, Ken's gonna talk a little bit about once you get into those leadership roles, whether it's executive or managerial, there are some, there are some specific tasks that you're gonna to wanna to bring to the table, some um, responsibilities you'll be expected to execute without anybody telling you to do it and how to do it. The, the things that I'm gonna discuss here is really how to make a successful team. And uh, if I would first of all tell you, these concepts are in the book called Good to Great from Jim Collins. Uh, I use this, these concepts with every team and every organization that I stepped into. And it starts with evaluating your team and getting the right people on the bus. And once you're there, you have to say, what's keeping this team from performing? Is it will or is it skill? If it's skill, it's pretty easy to address. You find out what an individual's lacking in skills and you find ways to get them that training. If it's will, Usually it's a lack of motivation. And, uh, and you find what is it that motivates these individuals, and then you, you work towards that goal to get them the motivations that they're looking for. And there's, there's a lot of different ways of going about and doing that. But I'm gonna walk through the things, with the, the exception being sometimes dollars, you don't have control over those dollars. But there are, if you do some of these other things, you'll see that will change itself. And I just talked about ensure you have the right people on the team. Once you've done that, ensure they're in the right seats. Look at people's strengths and find out what are they good at and then what in your organization. If they're good with people, you know, and you've got an HR role, that's the place where you want to have them, whether it's someone who's going to be interacting with people all the time, whether it's especially in a sales organization. If they're good with numbers, then, hey, they might be someone you want to move towards uh, engineering or uh, finance areas within your company. And then when you're building goals for your team, do it as a team. Don't do it as a directive that here's what we're going, here's what we're going to achieve, and here's how we're going to do it. Then you don't get buy-in from your team. So ask questions, do team building, uh, do set goals as a team, and then simplify processes. And this is, again, working with your team and finding out you know, if if it's not broke, don't fix it, keep doing it. We had a situation where people were filling out a certain form every time they went into a store and they had to fill this form and they were tracking this form. I says, so I'd ask me, how many times are you getting sales off that? No, but they want it done and they're tracking. I said, well, I says, we're not gonna do it anymore. And I said, they said, well, what about the tracking, Ken? I says, don't worry about it, I'll take care of that. So if it's not, if it's if it's not getting you value, get rid of it. And then this is probably the most important part once you're in, in charge of any team, establish and implement performance tracking. You're gonna find people that, that will perform well and wanna be number one. You're gonna find people that just wanna be average. You're gonna find people that just wanna be close to average, but you're not gonna find anybody that's happy being in last place. So always rank everyone on the team, let everybody see where they're at, don't berate or beat people up because of that. Just post the rankings and the rest will take care of itself. And then our personal goals, if I had a sales goal of 5%, I usually set it my goal at 7%. I thought for sure my team could do 2% more and then I would break it down for them in numbers. And they say, you yeah, know, we can do that. And then celebrate success and always celebrate success with others and people present. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide here. So you'll notice that as we've gone through the presentation, we haven't given you a step-by-step -step accounting of the positions that Ken and I have held as we progress through our careers. That's because it isn't the positions or the titles that we held along the way that determined our success. It was the skills that we developed and the way that we approached the, our careers that got us there. Here are some of the things that we did that you might wanna consider doing as you're plotting your own path. The first I would say, this is an adage that I'm sure all of you have heard, just as Ken mentioned dress for success, first impressions matter and you only get one chance to make a first impression. That not only has to do with your physical appearance and the way that you hold yourself and present yourself to others, but in this digital age, it's also your online presence. 
it really isn't unheard of for an HR person who's screening resumes to Google the person that they're gonna put forward for management to consider to interview. And so as you think about your Facebook presence, does it reflect who you are today or does it reflect who you were five years ago, 10 years ago when you were in high school? Does it contain language that would be offensive to the average person? Does it, you know, what, what kind of impression do you make? Does it make the impression that you would want to make to a prospective employer? Also think about your email address. Um, Ken has a great example of what you wouldn't want to use for your resume. I had a friend of mine who uh, was looking to get promoted and yeah, he sent me his resume along with his email and right across the top of his email, it said reckless at yahoo.com and I'm going, are you kidding me? Safety is important in our organization and I'm not sure I'm ready to hire somebody that, that their lead name on their email is reckless. So think about that as you're submitting applications. And it's fine to keep that reckless email for friends and family, but for professional purposes, you might want to move to something more planned like bkjodoc at yahoo.com. I would also encourage you to have a vision. And I don't mean by this that you have to know what you want to be when you're 60. You know, you don't have to decide what you want to be when you're all grown up at this stage in your life necessarily. But at least if you know where you're going, then you'll know if you've got there. Right? And so just whether your vision is just that you want the, the next ring on the ladder of your career progression, or your vision is that you want to be able to buy a house, whatever it might be, if you at least have an idea of where you want to go, then you begin to get yourself there. You begin to move in that direction. And so once you have that vision, develop a plan. And it's not enough to have a plan. You have to execute it. What is the saying that you have, babe? Fail the plan plan to fail. So have a plan and execute it. And your plan might want to include some of the other things that we have listed on this, uh, on this slide. So establish a relationship with a committed mentor. I've had multiple mentors throughout my career and I've been mentor to men multiple people throughout my career. It's important when you enter into a mentorship relationship that you as the mentoree know what it is you want to get from that relationship. So when you approach someone to become your mentor, please make sure that you say, I would really love it if you would mentor me in this way. This is what I admire about you or, um, and it doesn't have to be, I want you to teach me how to type 87 words a minute. That's not the kind of thing that I'm thinking about. But what are, what are the personality attributes that you would like them to help you develop in yourself? Or do you want them to help you develop a career plan and you don't know where to start? Whatever it might be, if you have a specific ask, it makes it much easier for them to set you up for success. And the reason I say to have a committed mentor is because almost anybody that you approach that you say, I would really love it if you would mentor me, almost everybody's going to say yes, because it is, is extremely flattering to be asked to be someone's mentor. But not everybody knows what is involved in being a mentor. If someone's never been a mentor before, they might not understand just what that means. So you want somebody who's willing to commit to weekly or monthly check-in times with you. Somebody who's gonna give you an assignment, whether it's a book to read, or if they want you to join Toastmasters, or if they want you to do a group presentation, um, whatever it might be. Somebody who's gonna challenge you, and who's gonna hold you accountable, and who's gonna meet with you on a regular basis to make sure that you are following through and that you are in fact growing in the way that you wanted to grow. And Men mentors are meant to be there for a season. Once you have mastered whatever it is you came to master with that person, feel free to thank them for the time and move on to someone else. You know, as you grow, your mentorship relationship should also be growing. Interview people who have the job you want. Ken, I think, mentioned this earlier. So if there is a job in your organization that you think, gosh, I would love to do that job. I wonder what it takes to, to get there. Call a person up, ask them if you can take them to coffee, ask them if you can take them to lunch, meet with them for 30 minutes in their office and tell them that. Just say, you know, I would love to do what you do someday. And I'm just curious, what would you recommend that I do? What steps should I take? What skills should I develop? What relationships should I establish? People really do enjoy, they're flattered by that kind of attention. Um, and then sometimes you have an opportunity to shadow those same individuals. So, and, and some organizations have formal programs that allow you to do this. 
some organizations have never thought about doing it, but it's possible that if you went to your boss and you said, I'd like to spend a week shadowing Bill or Edna or whoever in this role over here, um, and I wondered if it would be okay if I take two hours a day or two hours a week to do that. I highly encourage that in, in my organization. And uh, it's also a great opportunity for you to build uh, a networking contact that you never know where that person's going in their career too. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and it may be risky for you to do that. And you may be afraid that if you go to your boss, he's going to think you're going to quit. A good boss considers it a compliment when his employees get hired by another department within the company. It's, it's a compliment to him or her that they recognized quality individuals and hired them and that they've grown that person in a way that will allow the organization to continue benefiting from their skills. So, you know, it may not be as scary as you think it would be. Um, actively applying for more progressively responsible roles. This may seem like a no brainer, but what's important is that you don't stay in your role waiting for somebody to invite you to apply for another role or you don't get stuck in your role and forget that there's a whole other world outside this company. If it doesn't look like your career is going anywhere or if you're in an organization maybe that is small and somebody has to die for you to get promoted, then you might wanna think about looking outside your organization and actively looking for other employment. And, and I don't mean uh, because you can't, you're not happy where you are, but because you wanna grow and there's not that opportunity there. So actively seek progressively more responsible roles. They don't have to be big bites of the apple. It can be just a little bit at a time like I did for those 20 years that I was a military spouse. And when you do apply for those roles, I strongly encourage you to include an individualized cover letter with every single resume. This may sound old fashioned. You may think that in digital era, nobody pays attention to it, but I promise you they do. When you write your cover letter, ad address the job that you're applying for. Talk specifically about why you're excited about applying for this job and why you think you would be a good fit for this job. And end your letter and, and in, in that resume, reference the skills that they'll find when they look more deeply at your resume. And end your letter with a comment like, I look forward to talking with you in greater detail about how, I can, how the organization can benefit from my expertise or my skills, something along those lines that just says, I believe you're gonna call me. You don't wanna miss this opportunity. And finally, when you get those interviews, send a thank you note. Always send a thank you note. Um, again, sounds old fashioned, but really important. Um, and send it to everybody that you have interviewed with. Okay, next slide. So uh, remember where you came from. I think this is extremely important. There's many times where, uh, you know, don't, I was uh, as a store director, uh, I was not afraid to be caught with a mop in my hands. As a zone sales director, when I'm out in the field, if I saw someone who was having a difficult time, I would stop what I was doing and we would work together and help that person get caught up. And I tell you what, it goes a long ways in teaching the people you're working with that you still know what's going on. So uh, never forget that. And a little humility goes a long ways. Uh, sharpen the saw not the tongue. I had an individual that I, I love this guy. We used to call him Grumpy, but by the time we get done work with him, we, we had a new name for him. It's called Mr. Sunshine <laughs> because uh, this gentleman used to send, e people would send him an email and he'd be so mad. Sometimes he'd read that email and I'll teach them. He'd be typing that email and boom, he'd send that off and then I'd hear about it and uh, and I'd read that email and I think, what was this guy thinking? So uh, we had a conversation about his growth and, uh, and I said, John, I said, before you send the email, when you're feeling like that, send it to yourself first. Wait 24 hours and then read it as if you're the recipient. And I'll tell you what, John went from Mr. Grumpy to Mr. Sunshine because he really learned how to communicate with others in a positive manner. And it worked great for him. And there's been many times where I felt the same way, but you know, and you just take, take a deep breath and find out where is this person coming from before you reply right away. Think about it. And this is really important when you're managing people and, and you're trying to give somebody coaching. People are gonna make mistakes. 
people are, are, are going to do things they shouldn't do. They might even embarrass you as their boss. And there's ways that you can deal with that. And you might just want to rip them a new one. But I promise you, it would be much more effective if you calm yourself down, assume that person's innocence. As Ken mentioned earlier, he believes most people come to work meaning to do a good job. Their intent is to do a good job. So if as a, the executive leader, you assume that all of your people want to bring their air game and they want to succeed and you approach any discipline issues or any mistakes that they've made from that perspective and use it as an opportunity to coach them whether th rather than to give them a tongue lashing, it will go a lot further in growing your people and making your team a success. And you will also gain the respect of everyone around you. Okay, coaching. Uh, and others? Yeah, we're just going to go through these really quick because we're running out of time here. But um, coaching is something I think is important and um, that I would encourage people to coach up and coach down. And so for me, what that means is that when I'm the leader, um, whether whether I'm a, the leader of a sports team or the leader of a project or the leader of personnel, I always say to my folks, my goal here is to make this the best uh, opportunity for all of you to get the best results we can. If you have ideas about something that I can do, do, do differently to be even more effective, please tell me because that is my goal. And if, if I'm saying something that's not coming out the right way or it comes across negatively, please let me know because that's not my intent and, and I would like an opportunity to do better and to improve my own performance. So I would encourage you to not just tell people you have an open door, but to actively encourage them to tell you what you can do to be better, the people who report to you, not just the people you report to. And if you get that feedback, even if your first instinct is to get very defensive and say, no, 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 that's not what I meant or that's not what I said, take a step back and instead just say, thank you. Yeah, and I'll tell you, contribute to the growth of others because A, you need to find someone to replace you. And you'll also find that those people that you're helping coach and move through others are going to tell others. And that's just going to reflect more positively on you. The next one is, no, don't, you don't always know what to do. I would tell you, the greatest compliment you can give someone is, is to go ask for help. People don't look at you as it not, they don't look at you and say, oh, they don't, he doesn't know what he's doing. Said, so, no, I need support. And here's, I have a challenge with this. And then talk in a manner that says that they want to help you. And they will take that as a compliment because you're trying to tap their knowledge and they're going to contribute to your growth. If, if you're not sure, go ask for help. And I would say, sometimes you're going to work for a boss who's going to say, don't come in here unless you have a solution. If That's you don't know right. what to do, if you don't know what to do, then what did I, why did I hire you for this job? So sometimes that means going to your peers and saying, have you ever had a situation like this? I'm not quite sure how to handle it. Networking with other people, but you could also approach your boss when you've exhausted all other options or if you don't have an opportunity and just go to them and honestly say, listen, boss, I have this situation and I've not had to deal with this before. So I'm not quite sure what the best approach would be. And if you just talk to them from that perspective, they come at it very differently than if you just go to them and say, this is what happened and I don't know what to do. You know, and the last bullet point is uh, you don't always know, be able to get everything done. Uh, I, the region vice president that I worked for, so, you know, I came in from I was I had a headquarters job where I got everything done by Friday. I had down to two emails, and then I take over a zone and I'm getting 50 emails a day, 50 to 100. And man, I tell you, I'd have my talk to my boss. Well, look, I, how do you get everything done? Keep going, just keep going. Ah. Uh, so, and he said, well, you're not going to get everything done. And uh, you're going to have just, something's going to follow a plate, and you just have to decide what it is, Ken, and let it go. Uh, so one idea I found, I made sure I used calendarization. If I, if I thought it was important, I'd put it in my calendar. And if I didn't get it done, I'd move it to another date, to another date, to another date. And during the best, I'd say, you know what? This is not going to happen. Or you delegate. And that is another great way to do it. Delegate is a good thing. So, okay. So um, we apologize that we've gone, uh, we, we still have 10 minutes for questions, so that's good. But um, we barely hit the tip of the iceberg on how to approach a, a path to executive leadership. We hope that some of the information we've shared, if you got just one kernel of good information, then it was worth your time, I hope. Um, Ken mentioned sharpening the saw several times during the presentation. Here are some books that we have found useful in our careers. There is a plethora of books on leadership, on corporate culture, 
uh, on specific job sets, on relationship building, um, taking so initiatives. So questions. just uh, we would encourage you to check out what, what speaks to you. So Andrea, thank you for controlling the slides for us. Um, if anybody has questions, we'd be happy to answer them or help you with any challenges you're facing. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, okay, so we have one question here from Erdogan. He's saying, could you talk about the essentials of additional time management strategies and developing resilience? Does developing resilience? Yes. Okay. I'll tell you, time management is an absolute key. Uh, and I'll tell you, use Franklin Covey's seven habits of uh, highly successful people will really help you in that time management piece. But uh, I would calendarize, you know, my entire week would be set aside. And when I talk about putting big rocks in place, I would put big rocks in there that says I'm taking my wife out to dinner. <laughs> So that, that I knew that part of shotgunning this all was making sure that I took care of the people that, that, that I loved. Uh, and also with people, I says there, I'd say, you know, people would ask me all the time, I'm being inundated with things they want me to do for them. And uh, I told them, if you don't see me write it down or see me put it in the calendar, you get less than 50 50 chance it's going to happen. So I would put it in my calendar. When they pull it out, when I pull out my calendar, and then I would be going through the times and dates that I had available. A, it made them realize that they knew that I had a very busy schedule, but it also made them know how important they were that I wanted to fit them in. But always keep that calendar and then, you know, keep moving things forward, stay in contact with people. Uh, and the Outlook calendar works fantastic for that. Uh, and so I'll tell you, it's, it's really utmost to stay organized using calendarization. I hope that answer your question so and i would um a little more specifically there are you know there's a generation that's very comfortable using electronic tools um, however paper still works and so if it is easier for you to carry a, a paper calendar with you then i would encourage you to do that and you don't just write down your appointments that you have on a day at a certain time um, in the Franklin Covey style of calendars, there's a column on the left hand side where you write down the tasks that you need to accomplish and that you put them in the order in which you need that their importance. So I might have 15 things on a list of tasks that I need to accomplish in addition to six to ten, eight hours of meetings that I need to get done that day. And so what I would do is the night before, before I left my office, I would look at my calendar for the following day and remind myself of what meetings I need to be prepared for. Make sure that I have everything I need in place for the very first meeting of the day before I leave the office the night before. And also look at that list of tasks and put them in the order of importance. And to Ken's point about if something doesn't get done this day, I make sure that everything that's, you know, at least the top three items in the task list, regardless of how many meetings I have that day, those top three things on the list are going to get done before I leave my office that day. And the other items that I didn't get to, I need to move over. And they might not all get moved to the next day because I might not have time the next day. So I, I put on there, you know, I, I look and say, okay, if I can't do it tomorrow, when can I do it? But every item gets moved forward to another day. And then if there's something that I committed to have, and um, I also would make a note to myself what the deadline was. So to Ken's point, if, if I had promised to do something for someone else, when I wrote down in my calendar what it was I promised them to do, I would write down the date, the day it was due, it was in my calendar, but it also had it in my calendar the days prior leading up. If it was something that was going to take me a couple of days, I might have it in my calendar the week before or three days before, and I would put in there what day it was due so that I wouldn't forget and then suddenly get to the day it's due and go, oh man, I, there's no way I can get this done today. Exactly. And if I had it, things that were deliverable to other people, I didn't wait until the day it was due to tell them I wasn't going to make the deadline. I would know at least 48 hours in advance that the deadline was in jeopardy. And so as soon as I realized that I wasn't going to be able to meet a commitment to someone, I would get on the phone to them or I would send them a note and I would say, listen, just a heads up, I'm not going to be able to meet this date, you know, what can we do about this? Or, and if they said, you know, this is non-negotiable, I can't, then I'm going to have to look at what else is on my calendar and juggle my day so that I can meet that commitment. Because 
I am a person who meets her commitment. I don't ever drop the ball, especially if somebody's depending on me. I'm not going to let somebody else look bad because I made a mistake with my time management. Okay. Um, resilience, that's an interesting question. Um, would you mind sharing a little more information about what you mean by resilience? And then we can move, we can, we'll come back to that. Andrea, I saw there was another question that came in. Okay, awesome, yeah. So another question, what was the hardest thing you both found difficult to accomplish in executive leadership roles? Uh, things such as influencing others, goal setting, or managing a budget, what was the most difficult for you? I think early in my career, the most difficult thing was delegation. Mm -hmm. Learning to delegate, because I knew if I did it, it was going to get done. It was going to get done right. The, the, the challenge with delegation is you're giving someone else the accountability to get it done, and yet you're still going to be held accountable if it doesn't happen. So you have to build trust with others. And really, uh, for me, that was my greatest challenge was you know, is I started to grow as a, as a manager, giving other people my work, and it really wasn't my work, it was the teamwork. But uh, you can't get everything done. But as you learn to delegate and hand responsibility, uh, you'll learn to be a better leader. And for me, I would say two things. Um, there are a couple specific things that come to mind with that question. So the first I would say, especially as a young leader, the most difficult thing was firing people. If you have someone who just truly, you have worked with them and you have have tried to mentor them and tried to grow them. There are sometimes just personality wise that a person just isn't the right fit for the team. Um, and, and you really get to a point where you have no choice, but it's just the best decision for everyone is to let them go. And um, taking care of the business piece of that, which is documenting everything leading up to that person's dismissal um, and, and making sure that the company is protected against lawsuit. That piece for me is easy. The hard part is sitting down with the person and actually terminating them because this is someone's life that's being yeah. adversely impacted and you don't know how many other lives are going to that that ripple effect is going to touch as well and and it's very very difficult to put someone in that position and do it in a way that it that they don't leave feeling terrible when they leave your office i mean how are you not going to feel bad so that was that's the first most challenging thing and then um further along in my career i would say dealing with uh, dealing with higher ups who have unrealistic expectations. Uh, people who say, well, you just need to work harder or not you personally, but your team. They just need to come in earlier. They just need to work harder. And you're, and you're in a project and you're saying, you know what? They haven't seen their family for three months. They haven't been home before midnight for three months and they're in here every day at 6.30. They can't work harder. You know, and, and finding ways to get to speak to that leader in a way that they can hear what your team needs can sometimes be the most difficult role for me is that it's important for us. We didn't talk about this in the presentation, but it's important for an effective leader to be able to flex their communication style for the person that they're trying to communicate with. Everybody processes information differently. Everybody responds to information differently. And if it's your job to communicate, then it's your job to do it in a way that the person you're communicating with hears you. And they may not hear you the way that you would hear someone. So that can be one of the biggest challenges is, is learning how to communicate effectively with somebody who doesn't want to hear what you have to say. Awesome, thank you. Uh, could you also talk about how to figure out what kind of skill sets you need uh, and develop them accordingly? I'm guessing she means for a specific job. Yeah, we talked a little bit about that. But again, I would say talk to someone who already has that job. Um, and even if, if you don't personally know someone who has the job, if you know what kind of an organization they fit into, call the main line for that company. And I have done this before, and you may not believe it, but call the main line for that company and say, I'd like to speak to someone in this position. And they may say, can I tell them what it's regarding? And you can say, I'm, I'm doing some research on what is required in that position and the, and the skill sets that are required for that job. And I'd like to get this person's input on that. So that's one suggestion. Mm -hmm. And then uh, really when it comes to leadership roles is in your applying for leadership role, whether you know it or not, you've probably been a leader at some point. Uh, and I've 
hired a lot of uh, college graduates as we brought them in as managers. And they said, well, I don't have any experience. I says, well, have you ever, in, in a school project, have you ever been part of a team? Oh, yeah, been part of a team. Uh, on, while you're on that team, does anyone on that team ever not pull their weight? And they go, yeah, I, I know exactly that person, they say. And I go, well, tell me what happened. Did you step up and say anything? And what I'm looking for in some of that individual is, is it, were you willing to step up and say, you know, hey, we could do this better if you would show up for the meetings on time? Are you willing to, you know, you, you're going to have to face conflict as a leader. And, and at some point, I'm looking for people who have that conflict, who's been willing to step up and figure out how to resolve the conflict. And Pam brought a great point earlier, the initials S-A-R. When you're in an interview and you're asked, have you had any leadership experience? Think of those times where you were in a, a conflict situation with another person and describe that situation very clearly. Uh, let me give you the situation. Here's how it was set up. And here's why I had to have the conversation. Here's the action took. They weren't pulling their weight, so I pulled them off to the side, and I said to them, you come to the meetings 10 minutes late every time. I says, this puts all, all of us behind. Can you under and then they would walk through and explain how they had a conversation with that individual. And then they would tell me the results of the person start showing up for the meeting on time. They would start getting better progress. And it's kind of like the guy I said earlier, when I wasn't you know, groomed properly, and I, I didn't dress according to the what the, I was looking for for the job. Someone's got to be bold enough to have conflict and bring things up in a positive manner on how we can get better. So I, I know, Andrew, that we're short on time. So if we didn't get to, you know, if, if the answer we gave didn't get to the heart of the question that you were asking, I'm totally okay if Andrea shares our contact information with someone. Um, I'm especially concerned about the person who asked about resilience. I think that's an, a great question. I just want to make sure we give an answer that um, is, is answering the question that you meant to ask. So, Andre, if we don't have time for more, please feel free to share my information. We're not going anywhere, so if you have more questions, <laughs> we'll be happy yeah, to take it. Definitely. We have a couple more, so I think uh, with this last one, we can, we can finish. So, the person who asked about resilience came back and specified, uh, they're referring to how to be agile and productive without burning out in a sustainable uh, way. That's a great question. Um, and, and I don't want to short change this answer because there are roles that you guys are going to step into that will require you to work a 12 or 14 hour day. Um, you know, our healthcare professionals are a great example of that right now. Um, and I would say that always make sure that you put your mental health first and foremost. So whether you, if your employer gives you a lunch hour, take the lunch hour, even if it's just 30 minutes, make sure that you take 30 minutes out of your day to go recharge your batteries and refresh. Go take 30 minutes to sit in the lunchroom or go sit outside on a park bench. And if you're not gonna eat your lunch, that's fine, but read a book or listen to your favorite music or just breathe and listen to the birds sing. But take that 30 minute time. I always would encourage you to exercise. Um, I think that exercise is a great stress relief. If you can get, you know, do it first thing in the morning or do it at the end of your day or in your lunch hour, whatever it might be, whether that exercise is going for a walk or doing a five mile run, it doesn't matter, but just physical activity can be a great, play basketball with your friends, you know? It, it doesn't have to be a really big deal. It doesn't have to be a formal class, just some way to get your body moving. And, um, and I would say- I'd say to get it on your calendar. Yeah, that's true. And then true. make sure you do it. Yeah, and then have a practice for winding down at the end of the day. Um, and you know, have a routine that you follow, a 15 to 30 minute routine that you use to just quiet your mind. You know, if you're a spiritual person, make sure you, you take time to feed your spirit and pray, um, or whether it's reading a book or maybe it's, you know, watching, you know, true crimes on TV, whatever it might be, just something where you step away from the work. And then being agile in the workplace is, um, it's really, I watched a, a comedy tape one time when we were doing team building at one of my employers. And there was one particular scene that I always stayed with me. And this guy was talking about managing stress. And he said, it's really important to be able to separate yourself from what's happening in your life. 
And so he had like a chair and he was sitting in the chair and all of a sudden he jumped up and he looked at his chair and he goes, wow, my life is a mess. My life is having a really crazy day. I'm doing, I'm glad I'm over here doing okay because my life is crazy right now. And he was just talking about the need to make sure that you sort of maintain your perspective um, and know that what's happening is happening in this moment. It isn't forever. And if you find yourself in a situation where you feel like things are spiraling out of control, the conversation is spiraling out of control, or you feel like your, your job is spiraling out of control, just remember every moment of your life is a chance to decide differently. And whatever is happening to you is happening with you. You're participating. And the moment you stop participating in a negative situation, it stops happening to you. You can't have a fight with one person, you know? And, and if you're making choices at work or in your life that are getting you poor results, if you stop making, if you start making different choices, you start getting different results. So again, I don't know if that's helpful. If it's not, and you want to talk more, <laughs> just be sure to let Andrea know, but I hope that that gives you a little bit of uh, help. Definitely, yeah. And the very last question, when you hear the word leader, who do you think of and what about uh, them exemplifies leadership? Do you want to go first? No, you go ahead. Oh, gosh. Um, that's hard for me because there's so many people who come to mind for me. Um, so the first person I think of when I think of leader is his name is Don Sacco and he was the president of Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield when I worked there in Oregon. Um, and I think of Don uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, he was very intimidating. He was a little Italian guy and a lot of people thought he had a Napoleon complex because of his Italian temperament. But um, what I found to be true about Don is that he didn't suffer fools lightly. So, and that included me as a manager. I didn't uh, on a regular basis report to Don directly, but when I was hired to be uh, in a management position, he, what I did have to meet with him as part of the interview process. And I asked him, I said, so what is your biggest concern about filling this position? What is your biggest fear about the person you choose to fill this position? And he answered that question. And then he said, okay, your turn. What's your biggest fear if you take this job? And that made a big impression on me, you know? And I said, you know, honestly, Don, my biggest fear always is that I don't ever want the person who hired me to be sorry that they hired me. And there was a period where my boss was out on maternity leave. And so I had to take over her responsibilities and report to Don. And, and what I discovered during that reporting process is that I, other people were scared to death to report to Don. Um, and they were always very nervous. And what I found is that I never had any reason to be nervous because as long as I came to Don following Ken's advice, you know, if I said, um, here's what's happening and here's what I'm doing about it, or I would say, here's what's happened and here's what I suggest we do. And I just wanted to run it by you before we take action. I never got into trouble. And so I appreciated that Don didn't care what my title was. Don cared what kind of job I did. And that meant a great deal to me. I was never too unimportant or insignificant for Don to pay attention to me and to give credence to my ideas. Um, mine may sound like a canned answer, but uh, for me, it's, it's really simple. It's Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Uh, someone who's willing to surround himself with someone, with people of diverse, different diverse thought processes. And that they're willing to listen to all sides before jumping in and uh, saying, this is the way we're going. So you really do need to, to, to lead as a team more so than as an individual. 